Um, we do. Uh, we are a think tank and a development cooperation organization at the same time. So we have offices uh, all over the world uh, promoting uh, liberal ideas uh, together with partners, uh, such as the Lion Rock Institute here in Hong Kong. We had two years ago a big conference uh, co-organized with our friends from Lion Rock. So we were very thankful uh, that we can uh, be here with them tonight, uh, with you guys. Um, to introduce uh, Professor Baquet, he's our vice chairman of the foundation, but he's much more than that actually. He is a distinguished academic in Germany. He is dean of uh, the University of Magdeburg of Economics. Um, he is a frequent commentator in Germany, um, but also in international media. Those of you who uh, may read The Economist from time to time um, might find him quoted in um, the recent issue uh, regarding uh, what if uh, Germany uh, would have developed a little different. Um, so it's very well recognized uh, internationally. And um, he's not uh, speaking um, from a purely academic perspective, but he was also Minister of Finance of um, the state of uh, Saxony Anhalt um, a while ago. So he, he combines a lot of different perspectives, a lot, a lot of uh, different experiences. And um, in terms of the recent uh, Brexit, um, he's also a frequently uh, asked commentator. We are very happy that we have him here today um, and we are looking forward to a fruitful discussion with you on the matter and I would now like to invite Professor Paquet to give his initial comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's almost a coincidence because I was in Taipei uh, in the framework of the Liberal International where we write a new manifesto, which we will publish next year, 70 years after the first Liberal Oxford Manifesto, and I'm the chairman of the drafting committee, so uh, we have uh, 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 Robert Wintrakin as well here uh, as, uh, uh, what, what, what is your exact title, a, a general secretary or <laughs> something like this? <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, we, we will have to uh, leave relatively early because I catch the plane uh, tonight uh, back uh, to, uh, to Berlin. Um, and uh, so I will have to leave at 8.30. And this is a good reason uh, uh, why I uh, leave my manuscript, uh, which I prepared in uh, the pocket, and talk only very briefly uh, uh, and uh, sharply about uh, what happened and leave as much uh, room as possible for the discussion because I was told before that uh, uh, you all love to discuss and I love to discuss uh, also so uh, let's keep the introductory remarks as, uh, as uh, crisp as possible. Let me first uh, uh, openly uh, admit that I did not forecast Brexit. Fortunately uh, fortunately, I uh, was not alone in this respect. Uh, I think that uh, the, the polls did not uh, uh, properly forecast it. Um, the um, bookmakers, who are usually right, did not correctly uh, forecast it. And I think even Boris Johnson, uh, uh, even at least uh, given his reaction uh, in, the, in the night, uh, did not really expect it, and I'm not so sure whether he really wished to have it. Um, it uh, didn't take him long to disappear from the scene afterwards, uh, and uh, uh, he might have thought that a tight defeat, 49.8 to 15.2, might be the optimal result to damage Cameron, uh, and then uh, at some day soon uh, follow him, but uh, with him. Europe. And now um, let me, uh, from, from this uh, unfortunate fact that uh, uh, me as an economist, as usual, make wrong forecasts, um, it, uh, let me briefly analyze the situation as it is now. I have a very clear opinion about Brexit. I think that, does it, it stop, but uh, I hope you hear me, I think my voice may be strong enough. Um, I have a very clear opinion. Let's see if we can. Did I push somewhere where I shouldn't? Oh, yes. I hope I don't uh, mess up this one. And now I have a very clear opinion about, uh, about Brexit. Uh, I think uh, it is the wrong decision. I do not think this 
for some moral European uh, arguments. I think it, they were on, on very, uh, on, on, uh, very uh, simple arguments of political and economic uh, reasoning. I come to this uh, conclusion. I came to this conclusion before the event, and I uh, stick to it now. Let me briefly summarize why. Well, the central reason is that history is asymmetric. You know, if Britain had never joined the EU, it would be a completely different question of whether it makes sense to join uh, now. But it joined a long time ago, uh, more than 40 years ago. And it has become an integral part of the common market as it developed uh, over the last uh, few decades. And there have been an enormous amount of treaties concluded by the EU, trade treaties and related treaties, which uh, Britain uh, would have to re renegotiate, will have to renegotiate uh, after Brexit, uh, which is for a practical pur purpose uh, not very smart. However, uh, the fundamental uh, economic uh, uh, advantage of being member of the Union is that Britain has a kind of unique double characteristic or hat so far. The double characteristic is that on the one hand it is a very open country, a very good place for direct investment, a country which is in business to do rankings usually in the top group of the world. So there is no way of uh, thinking of Britain as a, as a country over-regulated by a bad, willing Brussels machinery. We may discuss, I know that quite a few libertarian friends are uh, uh, around the tables here, so um, I don't uh, defend in any way many of the directives that come from Brussels and which would better, better not come because the relevant matters are better ruled on a, uh, on a local, regional, or a national level. But be that as it may, these directives did, did, did so far not destroy the excellent competitive position of Britain in the world, especially with respect to services. So it has become an investment hub uh, in Europe for many outside investments. You know, the Japanese car firms invested, that the Chinese are very interested, that we have a lots of investments where Britain is, is and was the first address in Europe. Now, it was the first address because it is a very open economy um, and uh, not very regulated. Germany is much more regulated in many respects. But at the same time, it was part of the common market. So it combined the best of two worlds. Uh, and with a share of trade of almost 50% with European countries, uh, with uh, countries of the EU, it has a very high degree of integration. Now, on the other hand, the Europeans trade roughly 10, that 10 to 15%, however you measure it, uh, is the share of trade of uh, Britain uh, with uh, Europe. Uh, uh, sorry, Europe with Britain, I must say. So, uh, the dependence of Europe on British trade is much, much smaller. So that is a very bad starting position for the negotiations. I remember that Boris Johnson came up with the argument during the campaign persistently arguing that uh, the German car makers uh, would prevent uh, any uh, uh, non-free trade agreement uh, with Britain because they are so dependent on the British market. Well, they do export to the British market, and the uh, United, United Kingdom is for Germany an important trading partner. It's number four, but it is number four, not number one. And uh, the share of uh, its exports and imports is much, much lower than uh, the other way around of Britain uh, with Europe. So uh, I hardly see how the British can set up a strong negotiating position in the upcoming uh, negotiations. Now, what are these uh, negotiations about? These negotiations will be about um, two major issues, free trade and migration. There are many other issues, but in particular, free trade and free movement of people. 
The problem for the EU is, of course, that once the common market has been created uh, uh, since uh, uh, 1992 with the, uh, uh, the law program which finally led to the common market, there is an intricate link between the, the four big freedoms uh, in uh, the common market. The freedom of uh, goods trade, the freedom, freedom of service, uh, and uh, uh, in particular the freedom uh, of uh, uh, migration, which is uh, uh, of labor migration, which is an integral part uh, of it. And there will be no possibility at all that the European Union will give way at this point. Uh, so uh, the British will, at the end of the day, this is my forecast, well, I should not make any forecasts anymore, but at this point I make one, uh, that uh, at the end of the day, the, uh, the British will only get free trade, uh, an agreement on free trade, if they agree uh, to the free movement of people, uh, in the style Norway does and Switzerland does, which actually means that Britain has to be a member of the European Economic Area, as an EFTA country, if you like, and uh, uh, the Norwegian model is simply to adjust, to accept all standards from the EU uh, to allow migration, the free movement of people, and even to contribute to the Brussels budget. So all the, those bad things which uh, the Brexiteers have complained about are part of the Norway uh, uh, agreements. Switzerland is uh, very similar in result. It has been a completely different procedure because many different agreements have been concluded between Switzerland uh, uh, and uh, the European Union over years or even decades. So this took a long time. So I, at the end of the day, uh, the Europeans will say either you accept free movement of uh, anybody else, uh, free movement of people, and you get free trade, or you don't get free trade, you fall back in the extreme to uh, uh, World, uh, World Trade Organization status, WTO status, uh, and uh, you can then uh, have your own migration policy according to Canadian models or whatever they had in mind. So uh, if this is so, uh, the core of the Brexiteers argument simply doesn't wash. Uh, the Brexiteers told, in my view, fairy tales about the negotiations. Uh, and not the truth. Now, um, uh, if uh, Britain does not want to, uh, uh, to, uh, to accept free migration, and this was the major, the major point in the whole, uh, uh, in the whole uh, campaign, then they uh, will, have to, uh, will have to conclude very fast uh, uh, appropriate uh, agreements which uh, Everybody uh, who has ever done the trade negotiation says it's impossible within two years, uh, the time span which is allowed for the negotiations, or it will fall back to WTO uh, uh, standards. And that's, uh, I think, uh, let me put it cautiously, uh, this has nothing but disadvantages to bring. In particular, for the question, what happens in the meantime? What is the image of Britain? during the time of these negotiations in the world. And clearly, there is an enormous amount of uncertainty in this period until the end of the negotiations of where Britain will end. Uh, and this will, of course, hinder investment. I think that many investors, outside investors, will think twice again uh, whether to invest in Britain, uh, as Britain is uh, not anymore the bridge head, uh, the liberal bridge head in Europe, but is somewhere out there. So I think the investment climate will be massively worse, and the, uh, the, the, the tumbling of the pound sterling, which has been forecasted, uh, is only a short-term uh, problem compared to the worsening of the investment conditions in Britain over the long term. Of course, uh, this is all the more uh, troubling for Britain, because uh, Britain's comparative advantage, economically speaking, lies particularly in services. And many services are relatively footloose. So uh, financial services in London can relatively easily, or part, large parts of them, move, let's say, to Frankfurt. So by the way, Germany may even profit in a short run. But in my view, it's a short run profit. I want to see Europe in world financial markets compete uh, collectively with their uh, 
strength, uh, local strengths used and not uh, uh, substituting through a kind of trade diversion between the two. So this doesn't make sense. Um, uh, and uh, uh, if you look at manufacturing, which is not the strong point of the British economy anyway, um, that manufacturing, that, well, manufacturing that, that blossomed in Britain over the last 20 or 30 years is mostly for direct investment and in this respect the country will be, become less attractive. So, I mean, economically I see nothing but disadvantages. Um, I have a last hope. The last hope is that in the course of the proceedings, uh, the um, terms of reference so obviously change compared to the campaign that many people begin to think twice. Because uh, what, let's, let's, uh, uh, let the government uh, send this uh, uh, letter, this onerous letter uh, uh, of uh, saying goodbye to the EU to Brussels, uh, let's say in half a year, roughly. Then you have the, uh, the negotiations dragging on. And it will ever become more clear that uh, the alternative is roughly as I have described it. Then, of course, uh, it will become ever clearer to the public that this was not a particularly good idea. And then, of course, we have the inner British problem. Uh, the Scots will stand up, Nicola Sturgeon already made clear signals in this direction, and say, okay guys, if we don't, uh, want to leave the EU on these conditions, uh, we want to have a new referendum, because our referendum in 2014 was based on a completely different terms of reference uh, of a United Kingdom uh, which stays in the EU. And uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, if that is not the case, the terms of reference have uh, uh, changed. And the Northern Irish, I don't want to talk about the Northern Irish problems, uh, we may expect something like this uh, there uh, as well. So, a lot of trouble ahead, uh, and uh, I don't see any easy uh, solution. And maybe at the end, uh, uh, there would all even be the necess necessity to have a new referendum, if, uh, if uh, the terms of reference so much change. Now let me uh, briefly look at the end of my very brief introduction to Europe. Now I said that Brexit is bad for Britain. Very bad. Good. But, Good. Well, Good. Uh, Brilliant. but, Brilliant. but Brilliant. Europe, for Europe, uh, no. for Europe, it will be very bad as well. You know, we need uh, Britain in Europe. Uh, we need the country with its, uh, a country with a very pragmatic uh, liberal stance in the community, because of course we have different uh, uh, we have different strands of political thinking and philosophies uh, within uh, uh, the continent. And I'm a liberal, and I of course see that uh, if you like the Romantic strand, uh, which is mostly uh, comes from French, uh, uh, Italian, Spanish, uh, Portuguese uh, uh, political philosophy, if you like is much more dirigist and much more government oriented. So the Germans, um, in particular in particular liberal Germans like me, uh, love to have uh, 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 the company of the British in the, in the EU uh, as the ones who support a market oriented liberal policy. And of course, uh, once Britain is out, Europe will drift more towards a more interventionist uh, and dirigist stance. I don't like it at all, for good reasons, and I guess many uh, among you uh, won't either, and therefore I would love to see Britain in the EU, and by the way, not a, Brit a restrained Britain, which always complains about things, uh, how things are going, uh, and does not change them, but a Britain who really puts his weight uh, into the EU to make it more liberal. That would have been my preferred world. Now things have come differently. Uh, I don't know whether we still can change something. But, uh, uh, you know, as a liberal, I'm a born optimist. But uh, uh, the Brexit uh, is uh, one of the events which makes me quite, quite a bit more pessimistic about the future in Europe as a whole, both in Britain and in, uh, on the continent. Thanks very much. It seems I'm in the position of moderating a little bit of a Q and A. If we have some questions uh, for, we can pull out of that. Uh, if you have some questions for Professor Paquet, I'd like to just before we kick off and while you're formulating your questions, um, have another thank you to the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung.
Uh, Freedom Endowment Foundation have been a tremendous partner of Lion Rock for uh, for many, many years. We've collaborated in a number of events, and we're glad that you were able to sneak a little event in tonight. Also, a thank you to Bill Stacy, who is our host here at the LRC, our founding chairman. Uh, tonight's on his tab. Somebody, somebody's got to be a member, and tonight it's Bill Stacy, uh, as he was at our AGM. So thanks to Bill for hosting us tonight, and we're going to put him on the microphone later. So if somebody has a question for Professor Paquet, if you'd like to challenge him, Simon, you know, let it rip. We'll get a microphone over to you. Here, yeah, you have one. Okay, I've got, a, I've got a comment and a question. So the comment is, if you guys want the Scots, yeah, have another brief since I can Mr. Rajoy, though, is uh, not very keen on that one. Um, more, more, more importantly, the, the optimistic case was always that, um, as, as you sort of alluded to with Boris, it was enough of a fright that it would get the more liberal elements, liberal in an economic, classical economic sense, off the fence. Because a lot of things the Brits have been saying for many, many years, Behind closed doors, you get the impression that the Germans and the Dutch and Scandies, they sort of agree and they don't like the Dirigius side, although there is the Rhenish capitalism uh, element in, in Germany. Has it been enough for scare that actually basically Northern Europe stands up and says, actually, this, this whole move towards a super state, you know, whenever there's a problem, the answer is always more Europe. Um, going back towards free markets, can we actually catalyze Northern Europe to basically um, sort of try and change the terms of the debate? Because it seems to me that Club Med has been um, driving the debate, frankly, for the, por uh, the good portion of the since the Euro has been contributed. Where do you put Ireland in that mix? Ireland's an Anglo Saxon economy. Yeah. 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 Ireland's not Club Med. Ireland, Ireland, had, a, well, Ireland had a Hong Kong property bus. Well, I. Uh, I love the Scots, but uh, I mentioned, mentioned the Scots not uh, because I wanted to join the EU uh, um, when Britain leaves, uh, but because they are a huge problem uh, within Britain. And, uh, you know, uh, I think the problem with the vote about Europe was, of course, uh, politically speaking, uh, that um, the British public is not particularly emotionalized about Europe. You know, uh, whether the United Kingdom will stay united or not is a much more emotional question. Uh, once uh, a problem, the problem with Scotland, with Scotland comes up, uh, there will be a completely different debate. Uh, if uh, um, uh, the, uh, whether the United Kingdom remains united depends on uh, Scotland, depends on Europe, then we have a completely different debate. So this is why I, uh, I, mentioned, I mentioned Scotland. As to um, Europe, I do not uh, quite think that uh, the debate has been completely dominated by the mining parts of Europe. I think that there are uh, different interests, different strands. I agree, it's a perpetual fight within Europe between a more liberal, market-oriented uh, um, policy uh, and uh, a more dirigiste policy uh, in the kind of club med style, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, I think, uh, if, well, uh, this, this to some extent is unavoidable. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a continent which has decided to, to have a, a, a common market. So you will always have the strand, the strand uh, of liberal thinking on the one side and more social democratic or Christian democratic or whatever uh, thinking on the other. I'm not so sure whether Britain, when it was alone, will necessarily now use all its wonderful degrees of freedom uh, to, uh, to break free uh, into that world of pure market uh, economics. I may remind you that in this debate in Britain, the Brexit debate, uh, the National Health Service played a very important role. This is not quite a libertarian construction, I might say. And uh, you mean keeping, keeping the polls out of the country uh, and being uh, very, uh, uh, by the way, uh, the polls, the Romanians, go to London and then you see they all work. They're not living on welfare. So um, uh, the free mig uh, migration uh, is uh, um, uh, certainly, um, as long as it is not a purse uh, of the taxpayer, uh, is also, uh, uh, I think, uh, a core liberal idea. So uh, what, what I, I do not have the impression that uh, the, the, the direction in which, in which Britain breaks out uh, is libertarian. Uh, to some extent, to a considerable extent, it is xenophobic. 
and uh, with, the, with the discussion about the, uh, the, the National Health Service, it has even some odd, uh, you know, sentimental socialist uh, element. So, okay, the, three, the bus didn't say 350 million is not going to go to Brussels, it'll stay in taxpayers' pockets. It said it's going to go exactly. to HHS, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, the matter, I see your point, but. Uh, uh, is it going to change the framework of the debate after European countries? That's my question. Is it? Does it, does it change the frame of the debate in other yeah. European countries, especially in more uh, You mean Brexit? Yeah, but is, it, is it enough of fright for the Germans? Uh, well, I think, well, for German, I can't speak for Germany. Uh, uh, I think that Brexit is a shock to Germans. Uh, it's, it's not that, uh, you know, you, you have to, you have to uh, figure out that in, in, in Germany there are quite a, quite a few Anglophile people, notably among uh, liberals, like myself, uh, long-term reader of the economists. And, uh, so uh, uh, in this community, and this is not a small community, uh, you have uh, many feel that the baseline in Europe may now shift towards the club men, and we don't want that. So, uh, and we have good friends in Scandinavia, we have good friends in Eastern, in Central and Eastern Europe, and uh, uh, but we, we of course uh, uh, then lack Britain. So we will, uh, and, and I think uh, if we talk about the future of Europe, I would ver make a very strong case for a pragmatic uh, uh, approach, and not uh, as we have. Uh, 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 as we hear voices uh, demanding now, we need a more centralized uh, Europe. We need exactly the opposite. So Cameron, his critique was not wrong, uh, but uh, uh, we would better solve that problem together with Britain. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, I, I, I see out of it, but I'll just finish by saying, yeah, I think your, your point's well taken. I mean, everybody was kind of happy to let Britain carry the can, as it were. Um, you know, those Scandinavian countries were happy to have Britain do the work, but they didn't want to stand up and defend that position as vigorously as Britain did, and maybe now they're paying the price for not having the backbone that you're suggesting they should have had. Uh, this hand went up first, and I know that there's going to be something fiery coming from this Here we go. Yeah, you're going to need a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> but keep it, keep it. Don't, don't go all lawyer on us, you know, keep it tight. I'll keep it pretty much. There you um, go. Let's start with one point of agreement, but after that it's pretty much downhill. Um, the first point of view is Boris Johnson. Boris, Boris, Boris Johnson. First, Boris Johnson always wanted to remain in the European Union. So let's forget this idea that he was campaigning out, he was campaigning in. One person or one party wanted out of the European Union, and that was UK, the UK Independence Party. And as you alert to right at when you started, Boris Johnson loved shell shots when the result came through. And the answer was, he didn't want that result. Contrast that with Nigel Farage, the UK Independence Party. He was happy, he was joyful. Left at the point of the <laughs> so th there's a massive difference. Boris Johnson did not want Brexit. So we had two people, a pretend debate here, and it wasn't a real debate about the real issues. There's a massive disconnect between London, what I call the champagne socialists, the lawyers, the bankers, and the Champagne Socialist journalists and people from the Midlands and the North of England. And the reason why, and I'm English from the North of England, why we voted out is we're absolutely fed up to the back team of being told what to do by Brussels. You can't even buy the light bulb you want using your own home. Rules, regulations, too much of it. Immigration, absolutely. That's got nothing to do with xenophobia, it's to do with numbers. Because if you look in the northern cities, like Birmingham, Leeds, parts of Yorkshire that voted out, they are they're dominantly immigrant places, huge immigrant populations. And ironically, it's quite the small white populations if you want that your voter to stay in. It was, it's not the way you, you put in it. So what it was about was not about what you're, what you're saying, it was about you want to control your own destiny. As far as free trade goes, my idea of free trade is if I want to sell something and you want to buy it, I sell it, you buy it. I don't want lots of rules and regulations and standards about light bulbs stopping me from buying me what I want. And we're fed up of being lied to, if you want the German car industry, about diesel cars being great for the environment. They're not. They produce 14 times more nitrogen oxides. They produce PM 2.5s, which are not good for the air. And it was European rules and regulations that said, you will buy the diesel cars. And then we brought in together 
with Tony Blair, Mr. Weapons of Mass Destruction, another pro-European. We then had this stupid tax table that gave benefit to diesel cars and penalised petrol cars. And the result was reality in air quality in the major cities came down. The answer is, we're just fed up of it. And I think if it did go to a second referendum, you ain't going to get it for one thing. But if you do, there's going to be riots on the street. Because if you look at that map, you had a blue bit for London and you had a blue bit for Scotland. And the rest of it was out, 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 because we want control of our country. Brussels, no way, go to hell. Thank you. Yeah. Free trade means free trade. It's not regulator trade. Free trade. I make it, I want to sell it, you want to buy it. Free trade. It's not about standards, rules and regulations and dodgy agreements okay. where people conspire to set standards and run monopolies. No way. Let's, well, uh, first of all, can you... I perfectly agree that many, many rules that are thought out in Brussels are, uh, are stupid. But where was Britain when the rules came out? I did not see uh, that Britain really put up a fight to prevent these rules from coming about. Nothing. Uh, 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 we we didn't second. want the freaking rules, we just had them forced wait, upon us. That's the freaking wait, problem. Second, second, let's wait and see uh, whether, whether Britain will go over once it is outside the EU and uh, does, not have the, uh, does not have to conform to the industrial standards that the EU has that it doesn't use any standards, as you suspect. I don't think that uh, modern industry can, can completely do without standards. They save a lot of money. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, we have a completely different opinion. We have a completely different opinion. I, I take, take it that there are a lot of economies in standardization. Uh, in, uh, and if you talk to engineers, uh, in, in the automobile industry, they tell you that there's a, a lot of money to be saved by common safety rules, common procedures, common standards. So why we shouldn't do these, uh, these economies of scale uh, of, uh, uh, of standardization, I don't know. I think the price uh, is very low. In this respect, I admit openly, I'm not a libertarian, I'm a liberal. Uh, I think that uh, there's, there's a lot of scope for common standards. If they are voluntarily agreed upon uh, in, uh, in industries, notably in industries with uh, a lot of uh, 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 in, uh, uh, industrial uh, techniques, which... Wait, wait a second. Uh, finally, uh, finally, finally, finally uh, I uh, talk about the, the result in Britain. I do not agree with you. I think the difference, there is exactly the difference we have to describe between the, the, uh, the, the old industrial Midlands and uh, the greater region of London. Uh, and uh, some university towns and whatever. There's a gap. But uh, the reason is beca because you have a distribution of winners and losers from globalization. Uh, it's exactly the other way around, as you said. That's my opinion. Uh, in London, London is a typically globalized city, uh, one of the most globalized I, I know of. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the majority of people have, have gained from globalization, they're pro-globalization. And uh, in the uh, old industrial uh, areas, in the Midlands, uh, many have lost. The deindustrialization of the Midlands has been to a large extent the consequence of this process. This is the same phenomenon you see in America, uh, where you have uh, the supporters of Trump uh, coming from these uh, uh, the, the, the loser groups. And it's exactly the same as you observe in Germany, uh, where you have uh, the Alternative für Deutschland, uh, the, uh, the, the, the right wing populist party being strongest in the areas uh, where the industrial decline has hit due to globalization due to technical progress, due to skill-based technical, uh, uh, technical change. So that's my interpretation of the matter. You have a different one, so... Right, I, 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 want take, I want to take a question. No, I just want to come back on standards first. First, yeah, well, let's, let's talk about a simple thing like the light bulb. First, it was the first product to have built-in obsolescence. It was done by the Phoebus cartel, which is a German company, Osram, I think Philips got together. They limited the life of the bulb, the Phoebus cartel. Then, but when you, when you ban this incandescent light bulb, what you failed to tell people was it was a completely, completely different spectrum of light. It's a totally different type of light. And people should be able to choose, in my view, what type of light bulb they want to use in their own home. Sure, have your standards, but let people know what they're buying. Give people a full picture. 
what the European Union did was it took taxpayers' money and actively promoted LEDs and CFLs. And when that didn't work, it then said, okay, we'll go and ban the incandescent light bulb, so you have to buy these patented products. And then the light bulb companies that own the patents under a series of company structures then get all the revenues. And then you send the production lines out to China, they do all the dirty work and get all the cancer from the mercury and all the problems that you get from rare earth metals, but you guys keep the patents in a structure of companies very well hidden, and you coin in the profits. That's what that standard was all about. It was not about delivering to the customer what customers want. That's where the free market works. Sure, I mean, have whatever you want to produce. I agree, I agree with that. But what you should not be doing is banning products that people want and that people need. That is really playing wrong. Yeah. I'm going to take one question over here, and then we're going to bring in the rest of the panel, because I had a hand up earlier. I'll, so I'll cover this point for you. Yeah. I'm keeping this microphone. I have two questions. The first one... You will take a Hong Kong Chinese. Uh, Open the microphone. Yeah, microphone. Yeah, microphone just. Well, I, I don't need a microphone. Don't worry, don't worry, Andrew. We're going to get you on the panel. Let's send it for everybody. <laughs> yeah. I had four microphones. I'm down to one. Yeah, that's all right. I, I, I don't need one. The first one is just a factual one. Um, Everyone seems to agree that the, the worst case scenario is that Britain negotiates with Europe uh, by a WTO. So the factual question is, in practical terms, what's the impact of that? Does, does Britain face a 2% tariff, a 10% tariff? Um, so so that, that, that's uh, sort of the factual economic and, and the other one is, I think you made a very interesting point about uh, Britain having a, uh, a salutary, a liberal influence when uh, you know being within Europe. Um, but we've already seen with the Brexit vote, uh, they are going to lower their corporate tax rates to 15 percent, which is uh, the same as Hong Kong's or even lower. Um, so, so may, uh, is it possible that being outside Europe? I mean. Uh, it, it will continue to be competing, and perhaps that influence, and Europe is, seems to be quite much, there have been objections within Europe already, I think, uh, to the news of this, of, of, of uh, Britain lowering its taxes. So is it possible that being outside Europe could have uh, a salutary uh, effect on um, Europe by a thing with like taxes and perhaps other uh, measures that they will take for competitive reasons? But I'd, I'd be also interested in just the, the factual question about the, the, um, the uh, uh, impact of being just a WTO negotiator outside of Europe. Uh, outside of Europe. Well, the WTO uh, conditions, uh, you know, this is very complex. You know, the, uh, the, 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 there, are, there, are, there are many different rules, many different tariffs uh, for different products. Uh, so uh, uh, I cannot uh, precisely answer this question here. Um, uh, the, the, the w, at any rate, uh, it is, it is uh, I think, pretty self-evident that being part of, a, of a, an absolutely uh, secure free trade uh, zone, uh, as, the, uh, as the European Union is, the common market, uh, you have uh, better conditions in, um, uh, than, than you have uh, outside. So, um, you know, it depends on which products you sell, uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's a complex matter. Do you know what the average tariff is for, for Europe, for, for example? Uh, for the the average tariff, well, this is roughly, I guess, uh, 5%. Or something. The tariff is not, uh, uh, is not uh, the issue. I think uh, many other issues will come up. They're not, they're not part anymore of the standardization process. So the big issue internationally is not any more tariffs. The big issue is non-tariff barriers of many, many different kinds, which become ever more important uh, due to the uh, a world of ever more differentiated products and services. So, uh, uh, and uh, in the service field, for instance, it's quite obvious that you, know, that you, have, you are then part of a completely uh, different regulatory framework. By the way, the British have regulations in this field as well, uh, and they will have. Uh, and uh, um, it, so, so it is. Uh, uh, it is. Uh, uh, you really lose, uh, uh, especially in the service markets, in uh, financial markets. You lose easy access to a, a regulatory framework. How much this will uh, make uh, make out? We shall see. 
uh, I can't really precisely uh, answer the question. The, se the second part was on the, ta the the issue of taxation, and if Britain would be freer to lower taxes. Yeah, of course, which they of course, of course, Britain happened. is freer to lower taxes. It can uh, reduce the, the, the. Well, I, I mean, they could that they could have done before. They could have. They, they've been motivated to, for competitive reasons, they well, now lower their corporate taxes. So that might have a they, good knock on it. Because our, no, uh, the Baltic well, states were in and were constantly harangued for having low corporate taxes, yes, but they exactly. didn't raise them. They yes. just kind of said they just put up with a little bit of harassment. And so I mean, the, the, so. I mean the, uh, the corporate tax uh, uh, issue, well, you were free before. There is no ban to find uh, uh, in the European Union. You could have, uh, Britain could have uh, reduced within the EU. It is still in the EU, and it uh, reduces now uh, the corporate tax. It's perfectly free to do so. Whether the others are happy about it is a completely different question. Uh, but uh, it was sold, right now it was sold mainly as a compensatory measure and, uh, with respect to compensate for the worsening uh, of the prospect of not being part of the EU uh, uh, in the future, possibly. Uh, and therefore, they reduced their corporate tax rate. Okay, yeah, but, but, but the point is that, that might have a knock on effect on, on Europe. Say, you know, maybe we can't afford to have uh, corporate tax rates that are too hours. Much yes. Higher than, than Britain. So, so, in other words, that might be a beneficial uh, effect of uh, well, the UK being outside of Europe. Yeah, and well, it, it could have done it. Launch tax competition, it, it, which it, people it, in this exactly. it could, it could have done it. It could have done it within the EU as well. It has done it. It's still in the EU. So, I mean, uh, the competitive instrument of uh, lowering taxes on business profits. Uh, is still open. It has not been regulated by anybody in, in Europe. So, I mean, this degree of freedom was there before. Uh, it was not used. It is now used. Now, now there's been an extra spur to yeah. take that. Yes, and this, this, of course, this, of course, might have influence on yeah. over tax rates in Europe. But uh, uh, the, 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 uh, just as uh, the, the, the rates of Baltic countries, for instance, uh, of course, do have it. Uh, we'd like to expand the, the realm of our panel up at the front here. I'd like to uh, invite a couple of people in, in keeping with our not having anybody British up here. Um, <laughs> our chairman, our chairman, our new chairman of the Lion Rock Institute is in fact British. Does have some fairly strong opinions on the matter, but unfortunately is, I believe, in Europe. Bill, is that right? <laughs> yeah, right. He's, he's uh, on the Danube, I think. On the Danube is not shy of expressing his opinions, whether he's here or on the Danube. Uh, but we are going to be inviting two of our board members, our former chairman, Mr. Bill Stacey, who was the chairman for the first 10 years of Lion Rock, uh, originally from Australia, which is quite far away from Europe and Britain and all that. But he, he also has a tremendous background in, in investment and finance, and he knows his stuff. So please welcome Bill Stacey. I'd also, I'd also like to invite up, uh, have I got a working microphone? It doesn't really matter, I've got a loud voice and a big mouth. Um, Andrew Shun, Shun Pak Man, a noted financial commentator, we call him the mad genius on the board of the Lion Rock Institute. He is also very astute, frequently has original insights. Uh, he may not be a loyal subject of Her Majesty the Queen like Mr. <laughs> Stacy and myself. But I think he's. But he is certainly, certainly uh, a big fan of I think the, uh, the the Britain and the former empire. So uh, please welcome Andrew Shun Pak. I, I and, should say I I am a subject of the Queen. It's just not the Queen of England, the Queen of Australia. It happens to be the same person. Um, I um, volunteered to be on the panel mainly because I had a lot of questions, and I think we don't get enough of the European perspective, and I think it's really valuable. Thank you very much for, um, for for coming. And I suppose what I really want to understand is I've always, I, Simon would know that before Brexit I um, put my hand up in a, a circulation of emails that was roughly the same as the result, except the other way percentage-wise, um, uh, saying that um, I thought it would be a good thing if, if Britain left. And I, I said that because I think that the European idea of subsidiarity is a very good one. Um, and that Europe needed an impetus to return to that. But, but as an Australian, um, I think there are stories about, uh, or, or lessons, about when Britain effectively left the Commonwealth to Europe that are also instructive for what's going to happen here. Because Australia had a special relationship with 
um, Britain in the, the post-war period. That meant Australia and New Zealand had special access in a free trade sort of it, um, uh, zone in the Commonwealth that meant our dairy products, our sheep and other things um, uh, had easy access to the British market. And that all finished when Europe put up walls. So Europe was not all about global free trade, it really was about putting up walls um, to other parts of the world. What, what I'm really interested in though, um, and, and Europe to be fair participated in the GATT and the other things that gradually brought those down. Um, I think Europe also did some very good things that created freer trade within Europe. I mean, the airline system in Europe is so much better than the US because it's more privately run, the airports are privately run, um, uh, and it's a much more deregulated system than the US system. There are some really great things um, that have come out of um, some of the reforms from, from the EU, as well as um, all of the other things. Um, what my questioning is about is, is Britain a precursor um, because they are so European, um, but they're probably in some ways more democratic with the simple first-past-the-post voting systems. Is the will of the people in Britain something that reflects a very European attitude? So are the views that are expressed in Europe um, on immigration, on other issues, which as a libertarian I don't all agree with, um, uh, reflective of pressures that are there in Europe, whether Britain's part of it or not? So what's most interesting to me is, I suppose, a little bit of the question that Simon was asking that others were trying to ask about the, the, the what next within Europe and the political dynamic. Because I think everywhere in Europe there's a push for reform, but there's very little institutional response. And the institutions of the EU as it is didn't respond well to the financial crisis. They haven't responded well to Greece. They haven't responded well to the problems with the, the you know, tragic wave of of people leaving Syria. Well, in fact, even, even, the Remainers, even the Remainers pointed out that when David Cameron went to Europe for some concession uh, earlier this year, that he got nothing and therefore pushed Brexit. I mean, Remainers basically did nothing, but yeah, go on. So um, that's all I have to say. Um, but, but this is to try and um, create a discussion. So. Uh, Andrew, Andrew, at one point of David. No, 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 oh, please. No, 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 I'll give you the standards. No, I want, to touch, I want to touch on the standards thing. I want to touch about that question, that line that Robert gave just now about destiny. My two aunts, they both are Chinese people. They both emigrated to Great Britain in the 1970s. They both voted in the 1970s to join the then European Economic Community. One of them was a hardcore blue blood conservative. The other one Basically, she voted for Michael Foote in 1983. She's that red. In fact, she stopped voting at all after 1997 because she thought Tony Blair was a traitor to the Labour's cause. Both of them, hardcore Brexiteers. We're talking about Chinese migrants too. Right? Now, you would be, a lot of people say this is a generational gap thing, right? Young people want to stay in the EU because they think that EU is great. The old people want to leave. But I think one of the most important aspects that the global commentariat missed is that you only get to vote on this once every generation. And the old people realize this. And therefore, they want to take their destiny back. The young people, hey, if we stayed in the South, we can vote again. In fact, if the first referendum result wasn't to our liking, we can vote again. I mean, might be this particular generational gap. But the old people can see it. See? Uh, I understand that those days he's an expert in finance. I'm a financial, he's a banker, I'm a financial commentator. So I'm an expert in making jokes. <laughs> but there is a concept in finance called discounting to present value. When a vote like this only occurs once every 40 years, you would discount to present value the future trend for the next 40 years. Why don't you tell me what happened in Europe in the last 10? I understand the professor was a finance minister from 2002 to 2006, right? Now the state of Saxony. Which is exactly when Germany was the first nation to violate the, e the Euro rules on budget deficits. Right? I mean, I was, I was born a colonial subject of the Queen's, right? We understand that the British is really, to excuse these terms, because I know there's law lawyers here, right? But, but really anal about the rule of law. Why are you all these Europeans? Hey, <laughs> rules, right? 
No, but then of course, if you, if you discount the present value of the next 40 years, what the British, British see is this distant. Globalization is about a distant government run by elites, run by experts that set the standards. But unfortunately, every time you have that constitutional structure, smart people were trying to game that system. And they're gaming it through all these directives, right? It, ha it happens in every single government that's distant. And with the technology nowadays, these kind of gaming of the system is now being revealed. Right? And then you have this really motivated populace coming out, and it's happening. We, we, I, yes, I agree that Brexit and Trump is all the same way. The AFD, the Five Star Movement, you know, you have the Austrian uh, presidential elections coming as well. They're all the same way, which is this supposed enlightened elite is now being, has been hijacked and now being run by these people who are going to gain the system to death. And you extrapolate that for the next 40 years. I was surprised how close the Brexit vote was. I thought we were going to win by a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot uh, 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 further. And on the third point, um, sorry, I would just say that uh, I am a fan of Nigel Farage. I'm a fan of his speaking style. Okay? Uh, when the professor said the Brits never actually complain about all these directives being passed, I was like, well, professor, you haven't seen Nigel Farage's video online. <laughs> but anyway, um, I agree with him with a particular line. If you take away democracy, you will end up with nothing but violence and nationalism. Okay? Now, I am, I am going to ask a question which the longest serving executive director of the Lion Rock Institute, Peter Wong, has this theory. That no matter what the Brexit vote is going to, well, what the Brexit vote is, and the professor came to this, that Britain will never leave. That the, that the establishment will try to stuff it down the people's throat and de facto will keep them in the EU. Sort of when the EU constitution was voted down in referendums after referendums and then they came back with the uh, Lisbon Treaty. So that is at least, if you ask a small potato think tank in Hong Kong what they think is going to happen to Brexit, nothing. The professor said that it, the likely scenario would be the terms and conditions of Brexit will come out and will scare the people of Britain to stay back in, right? But whatever the tactics, Peter Wong, our longest serving executive director, says, you know what, nothing's going to change. Exact same thing is going to be in place, but they're not going to call it the EU. It's going to be symbolically left. Right? And you guys know the worst case scenario. Okay. Uh, it might, there's no Chinese saying. Outsiders see the clearest. Right? Um, the worst case scenario. I, I would like to go back to what I've learned in my GCSE classes history. The worst case scenario is war. And unfortunately, because of the advent of technology, most of the combatants of, of, of war now has to do it in an asymmetric side, which is they don't feel troops on a battlefield, but they will hijack a truck and run down people watching fireworks. If you tell me that you, if the German government are going to be granting passports to refugees in six or seven or eight, ten years, and then they get the right to live in Britain, and that particular sentiment gets whipped up in Britain, there is no way the Brits will go back into, into the European Union, uh, especially with the freedom of movement. So, uh, I don't know, I, I mean, you know, these are questions that I hope the professor can, can, can answer to, but at least that's the, uh, the, the feeling, the sentiment that we have. Can you, can you quickly summarize your questions? <laughs> so, so my question is about the, the, the future of um, liberalism in Europe today. Um, and, and in particular, uh, obviously, the Free Democratic Party has been pressured in recent elections. Uh, and given this, can it be, is there a way that you can... Um, uh, uh, Take liberalism forward in Europe. And my, my question is, uh, will democracy be once again ignored like they did in Greece and all other places? Well, your, your panel has turned into an inquisition, so <laughs> yes. uh, don't mind. Uh, I have another five minutes. Have, we have to leave, uh, I think, to you, I'm yes. sorry for that. You've got about uh, but therefore I pick only three questions. The one, uh, uh, I come back to the FDP uh, uh, as a last question. Let me pick. Uh, two other questions which have been uh, raised. The one about democracy. Uh, you know, if you had had one referendum, uh, must that be one referendum over, for one generation? I have serious doubts. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not ready to accept those, uh, who, uh, to the argument of those who say, stop, you voted, this is it. Uh, 
that because, um, you know, really now a fundamental process begins which changes the terms of reference. You know, if I were a Scot, I would insist of having a referendum again because I did vote for a Britain in Europe uh, and not a Britain uh, with Brexit. So uh, uh, I, I, I think it's a little bit of monopolizing the idea of a democracy to say that you must have one referendum uh, and that's it for 40 years. Um, and uh, the same holds for the Brits in general uh, uh, if uh, the conditions are really negotiated. I think this is a completely new informational basis for the voters. Uh, and I think it would be important enough uh, that they make up their mind. They make up their mind. They are not forced to vote now uh, uh, in favor of Remain. They have to make up their, uh, their, their mind. So um, uh, I, I, I think uh, to say that only uh, those who stick, uh, who, who, who do a, a referendum once in a generation are Democrats and the others are not. Uh, I have many things. One second, uh, one uh, note on standards. You know, um, uh, it sounds wonderful. The libertarian position sounds wonderful. You don't need standards anywhere in the world. Well, let me ask, why does do the dump Norwegians adapt all the standards of the EU um, just for fun? Although they are not member of the EU, they uh, uh, routinely accept all standards because it's in their interest. They, well, wait a second. They don't. They don't. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't need to do that. Nobody forces them. They do it for their self-interest as traders. So apparently, it's not a bad thing to have standards that other countries have uh, if you if you are highly integrated with that market. And exactly this will happen to Britain outside. So, you, at the end of the day, you will have a country which more or less follows the large trading bloc uh, uh, next door uh, because it's in its own interest. And then I, I, I ask myself, what is the game that Britain has that it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't have a voice anymore in Brussels compared to the situation before? Now, uh, a word to the Free Democrats uh, and liberalism in Germany. We had a very bad election in 2013, and there are good reasons where we, why we were kicked out of Parliament. I'm also a member of the Bundesvorstand, the board of uh, directors of the uh, FMP, so let me say a few words on that. But we are working hard on coming back, and I'm pretty sure that in September next year, we're going to be back. Because in the meantime of two and a half years, uh, where with no liberals in the German Parliament, uh, more and more people have realized kind of new information for them apparently, that it is important to have a liberal party because otherwise you get uh, the conservatives moving more and more towards a social democratic position. We have a convergence in Germany at the moment of, uh, let's say, uh, all parties going into a kind of uh, referist uh, social democratic position. So the role of the liberals as defending freedom and defending uh, civil rights and defending many other things uh, has been realized by the public. We're working hard on it. It's not an easy job because when you're out of parliament in Germany, nobody listens to you, nobody watches you. If you're a journalist, you know what happens then. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, we, we are working hard, and uh, in a parallel fashion, we are working hard in the Friedrich Naumann Foundation uh, to, to uh, again work for a, a strong intellectual basis of liberalism. And now, let me say, finish. Uh, with a promise that uh, I will come back, but I will have good reasons to come back to Hong Kong. First, this was a fascinating discussion. I love discussions. You know, uh, the more controversial they are, the better. Uh, and uh, I'm a liberal. Uh, and uh, uh, now, uh, the Friedrich Nauman Foundation, we are pondering about, we, are almost, uh, we have almost made, almost made a decision of opening up an office in Hong Kong. Uh, and that may happen uh, in uh, early next year, in spring, and I promise you, then I will be back. Thanks very much for your attention. And have a nice day. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we are gonna, we, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to let our guests leave. And don't worry, if you saw they didn't eat, don't worry. We did feed them a full dinner, soup, dessert, the whole, everything you're getting earlier on. But they do need to run to the airport, uh, Airport Express, and so we are going to let them go. So thank you very much to the Professor Paquet.
to our men for setting this all up uh, and Robert for joining us. So, Danke schön and Auf Wiedersehen, mein Freund. <laughs> okay, so they are going to step up, but Mr. Uh, Mr. Schund and Mr. Stacy are going to field your questions and we will continue the debate on issues related to Brexit. Uh, light bulbs and beyond. Thank you for All right, so we'll just give these guys a second to exit, and then I'm going to take some questions from this table over here. I've seen one guy with his hand. This is not Brexit. This is exit. <laughs> All right, and off they go, and we will once again continue with. No British people on the table, although we did have some Europeans, so that's pretty good. All right, I am going to take a question from this gentleman right here who's been very patiently putting his hand up for some time now. So I was under the impression that the Line Rock Institute and other civil rights institutes were specifically for the purpose of showing the alternative to people because the, the entire frame of the debate is that uh, your oppression is necessary. Like the professor said, okay, you need standards. The only question is of degrees. That seems to be the discourse of every country all over the world. But I thought the entire point of this place and other places like it is that, no, you, progress is, it comes from freedom. Progress does not come from the ivory tower. That's the entire point of this. So I, I do not understand why we're conforming to their standards. Well, when their standards are entirely wrong and dogmatic. Or why Britain's as, conforming as to your standards. I, I mean, I think this is... Um, can I just... Okay, please. Sure. Um, so, and then the second point is that um, they make this uh, mob rule, uh, majority vote, uh, as you said, okay, they can vote again. But what I understand is the entire point of a uh, thing like Brexit is for posterity. And if you can have rule of law, then it doesn't matter how many people voted for it, because everyone is free under such a system. But you only need 100% when you apply one thing to everyone. When you leave people sovereign to have their own, own standards when they deal with others, then you don't need this fake um, consensus, because there's no consensus. Different people will act differently. And um, my third point is that you cannot compromise with this, because it's an individual thing. The, the entire frame of the debate is that, oh, we're having this discourse and that you can determine how my life goes in this aspect and I'll control you in this aspect. No, I do not want to control you and I do not want you to control me. I thought that's the entire point of... Have you signed up for us? Yeah. Okay, we cool. need that kind of um, energy. Right. Yes, sign up to our last question. But yes, the first question about standards. I hope I made sense. Yes. Um, I mean, look, I think one of the tragedies of the debate about, um, uh, about Brexit was that it was very binary and that there was no discussion about um, the, the question of sovereignty, what, what that might or might not mean, and how that relates to individual liberty. Um, and whether, you know, I think that there were, there were people in the formation of the European institutions at an early stage that were genuinely um, liberal. Um, in a European sense, meaning fairly libertarian. Many of the German auto-liberals that, that were actively involved in the Free Democratic Party that I guess had had a vision of, of, of Europe that was very much like the, the heyday of, um, uh, of a freer Europe before Germany as Germany existed, full of many, many institutions below the level of the nation state that had significant power. So this idea of subsidiarity that um, is a very European idea that has really no equivalent, I don't think, in Anglo-Saxon thinking and leading and, and traditions, is that the decision making should be decentralized to the lowest possible level that can work. Now, if you're a libertarian, you say, that's me. Um, the you know, libertarian view is just a radical part, component of the, 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 um, the idea of subsidiarity. But I think... The, the good part of the European idea was that, like the Hanseatic League um, or others, that a city could be a city that could be very different, could have a lot of independence, and could operate in a broad free trade area with all of the countries in Europe, um, and be less bound by the nation state. Now, that's a very different vision to what came about with the treaties that emerged in the late 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, and became the EU as it is today. That is obviously offensive to 
a libertarian position, but it's offensive to, I think, a very mainstream liberal position, and to be fair, I think, to the position of the speaker that, that, that we had. I it's mean, I think... It's offensive to progress. Sorry? It's offensive to progress. Sure. So, no, I mean, the, 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 now that he's gone, I'm going to speak even freer. Uh, <laughs> because you, you, we all felt that he said, you know, you brought up, you, you, you need standards. You need standards. Your answer should have been, there will be standards, but spontaneously coming yeah. from the people, right? Yeah, right. You know, that, that would be the short answer. And then on, on, on democracy, or, you know, the question of democratic will. Uh, the Lion Rock Institute was founded uh, 11 years ago, and one of our founding tenets, I'm sure Andrew Work can correct me if I'm wrong, is that we don't talk about how power is distributed. We only talk about how power is exercised. So it could be the EU, it could be the British Parliament, it could be devolved down to an independent Scotland. It doesn't matter. For example, it should not be banning incandescent light bulbs. Right? The policy. The meat of the policy. <laughs> but if you want to know, the Lion Rock Institute is very consistent on most things. Um, in fact, I always joke that if you took our intern, Andrew Johnson and Alan Pemberton over there, and you ask them a general policy question, the answer will be identical to the one that Bill Stacey or our current chairman, Nick Salesworth, would provide. Uh, of course, you two would probably deliver it with more energy than they do. Uh, but there are two particular policy areas in which within the Lion Rock Institute there is a huge divergence. The first one will be the question of democracy. Okay? There are people in the Lion Rock Institute, high-ranking members, uh, they don't believe in it. They believe that democracy actually lends the government legitimacy to exercise its coercive power. And therefore, it will nothing be the tyranny of the majority against the minority. In fact, one particular member celebrates the fact that Occupy Central failed, because now that the Hong Kong government is completely delegitimized, uh, it can do nothing. Think about all the successful policies that the Hong Kong government tried to push in the last few years. None of them worked. None of them has been successful. Can't even appoint four more people to the Medical Council, right? Great! Great for that positive non-interventionism. I, I, I won't correct you, but I'll let you know, which is why the Lion Rock Institute doesn't take positions on issues like that. Then we become a big tent. We don't do We democracy. become a big tent. So if you have different views on democracy, no matter how, you know, it doesn't matter, we'll welcome you, as long as you don't support a government ban on light bulbs. <laughs> now, on the second diversion point, I have to add one more thing, because uh, this is also a Big Ten question. It's the question of monetary policy. Uh, Milton Friedman, of course, is a you know, well-respected figure within our group. Uh, you know, but uh, on monetary policy, there is a, quite a few Austrian school uh, economists, amongst, or at least believers in the Austrian school, who doesn't believe in quantitative easing, who believes the banks should have failed in 2008, because even if the financial system collapsed, all the productive assets, like the oil tankers, the, uh, the buildings, the factories, are still there, right? As long as the ownership is cleared up quick enough, the economy will pick back up. But, uh, so if you do have a different view to us, to a, our established position. You just need to stop. Uh, will they own it off? UB. Is it UB9581? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Oh, oh. Uh, there's a. Uh, your car is off somewhere. Uh, oh, yeah, monetary policy. Uh, on monetary policy, that's a divergent view. Okay? There's, there are some who believe in, Mar in Milton Friedman, in the uh, Ben Bernanke, you know, if a financial crisis hits, you have to, uh, you have to ease money supply. But then, of course, the Austrian school, which is if you use money supply, you bail out the banks, and therefore you perpetuate the uh, malinvestments and the inefficient allocation of capital. But, back to Bruce Lisi. Are you, are you commenting, or can I, can I put a question in? All right, I guess so. Um, I've got a question, maybe we can get it. other people in the audience might be able to comment on this. 1987, uh, 86, 87 was when I started getting involved in politics. The big issue for my country in the big election coming up was free trade with the United States. And the business community got out and they fought hard to get that free trade. They were very public in the debate. With regards to Brexit and things like WTO and anything that would increase free trade, business has been, in my opinion, completely AWOL. Maybe somebody who was in Britain could tell me otherwise, but 
you know, we're looking at some of the impact of this Brexit right now. Um, the privacy shield that the uh, Europe had negotiated with the United States was going to allow major internet companies to transfer data between the Atlant across the Atlantic to various data centers, because the direction they were heading was just ban it. You're not allowed to move private da privacy data into a country, and anybody who knows how global internet companies work, so that doesn't fly. Um, where were the tech companies during Brexit? Silent. Open skies. Uh, we had mentioned that earlier, Bill, you talked about it. Uh, it's going to be a real problem for Britain in terms of their access for, for the airlines headquartered in the UK to have access to, you know, be able to fly into Europe and also in terms of the European deal that makes it easier for European carriers to get to the United States. Where were the airlines? AWOL. Uh, the pharma industry, 2018, the Unitary Patent System courts for all of EU were meant to be in Britain. Now it's not going to apply to them. The courts aren't going to be there. Pharma, silent. Uh, chemicals industry, deals that were done there to allow chemicals to be sold all across the EU under one registration system instead of, you know, 30, silent. And telecoms, um, where, what, what's happened to business? Business has gone completely AWOL globally on the issue of free trade and supporting free trade. Um, is there anybody that can comment on that? Have I read that wrong? Right? Or have they gone to sleep and are they cowering? I think somewhere along the line, the, the post-war institutions that contributed to an opening of the global economy, um, you know, initially GATT became WTO, became um, captured by other political objectives um, and stopped working properly. I mean, it's a, there is a, an enormous gulf between what was trying to be negotiated with things like um, TPP, which is controversial in the US at the moment, and the early wave of a push towards free trade, which was largely um, about reducing tariff barriers. Um, and I think that the agreements are, these days, a lot more about setting rules for trade to happen than opening and creating um, freer markets. And in that process, many businesses have been complicit. They always have been. I was involved in the GATT negotiations that were the um, trade and services negotiations that ended up stalling. And it was very clear that the US government, when it came to insurance, was negotiating on behalf of AIG. Um, and you know, AIG was pursuing its interests, that was okay, but AIG was grandfathered into China with preferential rights there and many other countries in Asia. Um, and the US did nothing to argue for open access to the insurance industry um, in the countries in Asia. Um, uh, other countries, Australia, New Zealand, um, uh, did push for, um, the UK, which had a big insurance industry, did push for that. But when the U US didn't push, nothing happened. So, so I, I certainly think that um, there, there's no question that the vested interests of, of business have frequently been used to strengthen r rules that um, uh, lessen that. competition. No, one more thing about the, you, you said you got involved in the 1980s, right? Which led to NAFTA. Yeah, right. Um, I think that a lot of these post-war institutions required individuals who could remember the war. The first time that WTO or GATT started to fail was 1990 in Seattle, I think. 2000 in Seattle. And you had the baby boomers generation take over, right? I don't think they appreciate what's at stake. When you see neighbors chopping up neighbors and, you know, artillery shells being fired in your town, you become much more flexible in what you can accept to prevent that happening again. But I think the baby boomers generation have never seen that. Right? I mean, even the professor himself never actually said that the European Union was created because in the prevention of war. In fact, if, if there was no freedom of movement of people and the young and the restless of Greece couldn't have gone somewhere else, I am pretty sure there would be Greek terrorists in Germany bombing them right now with the way the Germans took away their sovereignty. Right? So, uh, anyways, uh, some of the institutions and some of the ideas of the EU still work, such as the free movement of people and prevention of war. But uh, I don't know. Maybe it's just the people. Maybe it's just the general Sorry. I think we need to give war a chance. Well, to be honest, to be honest, I mean, I always tell my interns this, right? I always tell you guys this: that the uh, that the France and Germany went to war three times prior to 1945. 100 years prior to 1945, they went to war three times, and them being in peace is actually a natural state. Right? Especially with Britain's foreign policy, as explained in Yes Minister, of stirring the pot on the continent, right? You know, so, it, it, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the, the European Union might have been this structure that was I mean, The first time I appreciated the European Union was in 1999 in my own graduation at the University of Michigan when Romano Prodi 
the then EU president was granted an honorary doctorate. And he said a very simple line that stuck in my mind. He, he said that the way that we can solve the Yugoslav civil war was simply to kick every single Yugoslav republic into the EU. Because if this system can work to prevent war get from, you know, between Germany and France, it can prevent war against anyone in, you know, in, in the world. So uh, at least that's, that's when I first heard about the EU and started thinking about it. Um, but so I think this, this generational thing is quite important. I suppose just a quick comment on your last point. There is another theory that, that you could involved with has prevented these type of wars, and you still had you still had the Bosnia war and so on within the EU. That's just another comment. Um, what I'm interested in, and it's really interesting hearing the professor tonight, is how European that view is, and that whole argument that you were either, if you're globalized, you voted to remain, and if you were localized, you voted to, to leave in the sense that you still had 40% of London votes to leave, or more. Um, and at, the same, at the same time, you hear stories like Britain's trying to find trade negotiators because they don't have any, which kind of shows how much it was handed over to Europe to do all their sort of trade negotiating for them, and the simple fact that Europe hasn't been able to come up with any free trade agreements. In the do you see all the problems here, sir? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and to me, that shows how actually Europe was so self-obsessed with itself that it, it almost got the rest of the world. And, that, and to a certain extent, the Brexit now provides the UK with the opportunity to not only negotiate with Europe, but also with the rest of the world on a better footing. And I wonder about your comments. The, 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 I like, I'm oh, sorry, I love the uh, self Um Because the professor kept saying that Nicola Sturgeon of Scotland wants another referendum because the terms and conditions have changed, right? I'm saying they're going, ah, yeah, Nicholas Sturgeon would demand another referendum and any chance like, It doesn't matter what it was, you know? It could be like, you know, it could be a change of anything. Oh, Prince Charles is going to be king. I want a referendum. <laughs> right? <laughs> so do we. In Australia, too. Right, that's, you know, you know, that's a Scottish National Party. They're itching for a referendum anyway. <laughs> and even if they had a... My aunt, uh, who's the hardcore Labour, Labour supporter, right? She said that even if they had another Scottish referendum, the biggest difference between the Scottish referendum and the EU one is that EU, you're leaving behind the European Union, right? Yes, you can talk about net transfers to certain areas and stuff, but you are talking about an area that if you extrapolate 20, 30 years down the line, it's going to go down the line. But you know, the English economy or the Welsh economy is so much healthier. And therefore, Scotland can't, you know, if all you do, that's, all, that's what they did. Scott, you know, the independence movement for Scotland was trying to lead in their referendum until they played the uh, British pound card, which is, oh, you want to leave? You, you're not going to be able to use the British pound. Go ahead and use the euro. Join the eurozone, right? And that was when the polls changed. So, uh, um, I put the question. What was the question? <laughs> Sorry. Maybe well, no, right. I can pick it up in a couple of ways. I think um, one thing that's very clear is that the institutions of the EU are very weak. They're, they're both fairly odd in that you have some sort of a legislature but it has no real say in any deliberative decision making about anything that happens. So the, the truth is that the Eurovision Song Contest, despite all of the controversies, despite the terrible music, um, despite the alliances between neighbouring countries that are odd, has far more legitimacy than the EU institutions. People accept that the winner of the Eurovision Song Contest genuinely is the winner. And, and is it Australia in it? Most of them. And Australia's in it, of course. It's a great. This is a vision of Europe that we can love. Australia's had honoured participation, and I think came third or second um, in the latest Eurovision Song Contest. So, um, uh, so, so firstly, I think both the institutions of, of Europe. Really, anyone who believes in in Europe must be thinking very seriously um, about how these can be changed to increase the legitimacy. Um, do, you, do you honestly think that they're going to change? Well, the institutions themselves don't have the ability to change, do they? That's part of the problem. So this is not a problem. Brexit would be something that catalyzes the change, right? Yes. Um, well, secondly, I think the underlying catalyst is probably something very different. I think it actually owes a lot to the euro. That the, the institution of the euro um, required, firstly, a differential degree of integration across different countries. It encouraged 
the fast track of other countries to go to an ever more complete union. But most fundamentally, it was ill-founded um, uh, from the very beginning. And I keep on getting Simon because Simon's been writing about the problems of the Euro for um, a long time and long ago. Exactly. Um, you know, argued for a very long time that um, that it could never work. And, well, no, no, and I, this I, was I would disagree. Of view. No, I, mean, I, would, I would disagree. I think the Euro was one big game of chicken. The designers knew that they're going to have a big car crash, and then which required fiscal union. You know, when the new uh, Greek finance minister of Syriza, Varoufakis, went down to the tax department. I mean, when you're the finance minister, you go to the tax department. Look, he was told that the Greek no longer had the ability to log into the computers because now it's under control of the Germans. Isn't that what Jean Monnet had in mind? I, 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 I mean, I, some might have, but uh, you know, fundamentally, if not for the euro. You know, Greece would have had a much weaker country, currency, much stronger tourism, um, and a much stronger ability for the actually very good navy to um, uh, defend the southern borders, uh, or at least to manage the influx of people through the southern borders, as would Italy. Um, which was? Oh, one, 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 one final thing. The global versus local. Right now, especially the younger ones amongst you, okay? When you, when you have this doubt of saying, well, if this really distant government is deciding all these rules and then being hijacked and I want something more local, um, don't be afraid because the other side loves saying, if you don't believe in this overarching supranational structure, you are a racist, right? That's the favorite word, you are against migration. When you are simply, you know what, I just want to control some of the things that's supposed to be. So, <laughs> Don't worry, I mean, forget about, always, when you, if you ever go back in school and you have to debate about this, global versus local, always seize the opportunity to define what that word actually means first. That's what one of our other co-founders, Simon Liu, says, the violence of language. If they say globalization, you says globalization means a distant government somewhere else that's probably not elected by me, or my vote doesn't really count. Do not let them define globalization as or you're afraid of, say, colored people who live next to you. Okay? All right? So if you want to bring forth this, because the Land Rock Institute believes in cultivating and raising a new generation of crusaders for this church, uh, when you go forth in battle, remember that. Always seek and seize the definitions first. I could um, make one um, further point, I think, that our speaker was insightful about, is that I don't think there's any reason to presume that the UK will end up more liberal as a result of Brexit. It could, it should. Um, it's fine to believe in principle that Britain should not be part of the EU, it should go its own way, um, and it should allow its traditional institutions to, um, to, to reassert themselves. But, but that's contingent. That might not happen. And, and so I think it is um, you know, very much incumbent on, um, uh, on the, the British advocates of Brexit to, to make sure that the result is um, a Britain that's more liberal, because it's very easy to um, uh, conceive of um, uh, political um, developments that would make it less so. And, and one final I'll, I'll, point around that, I'll, I think there's optimistic middle ground. I think the EEA is a um, very live option for, for Britain to find a way of joining that would not be a dramatic change. Well, on, on the question of uh, whether Britain would be more free, all I can say is that they, can, they will never be able to pass a directive that bans the curvature of banana and cucumber <laughs> if it was presented at a local council. If a local council, you know, a town of 10,000 people says, you know what, we're going to have a directive from now on that bans from all the markets to the markets, cucumber and bananas beyond a certain, you know, a certain curvature. So I rest my case. I, I believe it can be free. I, don't, I believe it can be free. All right, we've got a question right over here. Gentleman's got the microphone. Just a moment. What has, pardon me, what has been the reaction of the Bank of International Settlements with respect to Brexit? Has anybody been paying attention to that? Um, so you know, the BIS is um, uh, is a supranational organisation that's really very independent of both. Um, uh, the IMF, which came out very strongly arguing for um, continuing integration. Um, uh, and you know, it works very closely with each of the national central banks. And it's particularly focused on the mechanisms for ensuring that interbank settlement, clearing and other things dealt with 
the clearing and other problems. But the BIS is a very interesting institution, I think, currently, because it's also been a source of a lot of um, uncommonly critical thinking about um, uh, about um, QE um, and about um, current monetary policy um, trends um, and the efficacy of those. And it's also been one of the very few places, I think, in um, the global supranational institutions that continues to be um, a, a strong advocate of fiscal discipline. Um, rather than a critic of austerity the way most other institutions are. So you know, the BIS hasn't come out with anything that I'm aware of that's a particularly um, strong view. I think it would have been very actively involved in being the link between um, Carney, the ECB um, and, uh, and the Fed. Um, but um, I think the way of thinking of the BIS is very interesting because it points to um, uh, solutions that are not government solutions but are more market driven solutions for very big global problems um, that suggests that you don't need um, super big governments to deal with all of these issues. All right, um, we're moving to dessert. I want to get one last question in before I surrender the microphones for the evening and we have discussion at the tables. Um, but to get a little parochial, Hong Kong, what does this mean for Hong Kong, if anything? <laughs> Either at a personal level, uh, Honestly, personal level, personal level, or on a well, as a former subject of the party, I still have my black British passport that says Hong Kong, right, with the, uh, the coat of arms on it. All I can say is that uh, it was the hope that uh, I remember Nigel Farage saying that why should a unskilled Polish worker be able to move immediately to Britain while a skilled New Zealand brain surgeon, a talented Indian computer programmer, and may I add, a uh, flamboyantly good, entertaining Hong Kong financial commentator, <laughs> have such difficulty to seek a work permit. But then of course, now with Brexit, suddenly Theresa May is slamming on all of these students graduating from university and their rights to study, or at least extend the work in the universities, and be treated, they have to leave the country. To reapply for work back. So I have no idea. I mean, they are still stuck in the mindset of if we have to hit when the people of Britain through its Brexit vote has clearly demonstrated that they're angry with EU migration, Theresa May is still hitting on non EU migration. So on that personal level, uh, yeah. So there's there's something to that sense that uh, this this idea that Britain will use their, their freedom post exit to institute a more liberal order, perhaps that's not going to be the case. Um, Bill, is there anything you'd like to add to that as a tour of what this means for Hong Kong? Uh, maybe trade deals or DTAs that Hong Kong is negotiating? Um, I, I think there, there must be a, a, a question about um, the, the geopolitical implications and constraints on China. Because I think that um, Britain in practice has shown much less willingness to, um, uh, to resist um, uh, China's um, uh, sometimes heavy-handed, um, to call them diplomatic initiatives, might be slightly wrong, but um, I think you know, Britain has been less able to um, stand up to China perhaps than the EU as a whole. And so I think, um, uh, and I think some of the genuine liberal elements of the EU that are active in foreign policy, especially on civil rights issues and the Scandinavian countries in particular have always been influential there it means that on um, a lot of civil liberties issues Europe is um, more of a champion than, um, uh, than Britain um, but Britain understands Hong Kong much better than Europe and the combination of the two and the work between the consulate, um, British consulate in Hong Kong and EU institutions I think was actually very very helpful um, in helping the broader world understand issues in, in Hong Kong. From an economic perspective, I don't think that there are many particularly large impacts at all. No, no, on, on, no, on the, no, on the understanding, on the understanding. Yes, uh, the EU didn't really understand Hong Kong, right? So when supposedly going to Germany with your British national overseas passport, they would treat you as a full British because of their lack of understanding. But anyways, <laughs> but, oh, one more housekeeping. Uh, I hope that you guys, I mean, I know Andrew works to say this, well, thank you for coming, but uh, if you do find this interesting, we do have a very active 
internship program that needs a lot of help and funding and support so you guys can help us uh, by donating to us. That would be great. Yes, and if you're not a member, we're strengthening our membership program, and we'd love to have you as members to help support more events like this. I know I have one gentleman here who's keen to ask a question, but I'm, I'm, I've been seeing a lot of side conversations that have quieted down since the desserts got served. So maybe, and your mouths are full of dessert. Um, so maybe I will allow the last question before we wrap up. You make it short though, right? Yeah. Not about light bulbs. Okay. <laughs> those, those questions are always long and rambling. We need to make it quick. I don't tell them to tell the microphone. So my question is, so did you feel... Sure, Pac-Man, Pac-Man. We got one more over here. Thank you. <laughs> what does this phenomenon of Brexit mean for developing countries? Because when globalization happened, it was the, country, the developing countries like India and China, they were not open to it. But then we had to accept it. Now we see Britain moving out of Europe. So does this help in reshaping the uh, institutions like BRICS? Or, in general, the free trade in countries like India? I think there's every prospect that um, Britain, in their active pursuit of uh, a more global role, especially the people who are actually doing it, um, will be very, very open to negotiations with especially countries like um, like India, um, you know, the former Commonwealth countries, or all those countries. You know, Boris Johnson spent a, a lot of time in China and India promoting London as a wonderful place. Um, and so given that there are existing cultural links, um, uh, I think there's um, every prospect that um, for the developing world, um, countries in, in, in Africa um, and in Asia in particular with their traditional ties, um, uh, they'll become closer to, to Britain. That won't be as easy a um, avenue to um, uh, to Europe as, as it might otherwise have been, but it won't be impossible either. Um, I understand that under the treaties um, of, um, uh, with Ireland in 1949, Irish people have automatic access to Britain and are treated as if they were local um, irrespective. So there's going to be a very porous um, interpretation, I think, no matter what, view of, um, of travel. So I, I really think there is a middle ground where Britain subscribes to a very open market arrangement with Europe and a fairly open arrangement in terms of people and travel and the movement of people, but maybe restrictions on immigration and taking welfare benefits when you get there. Um, that, that would seem to me logical middle ground and the Brits are always in it for a pragmatic deal. Um, uh, we'll see what um, people on the continent think about that. Oh, and for, if you want to take the lessons of Brexit back, uh, first of all, in fact the most important thing is this. If you run a continent of 300 million people and you centralized coercive power, and you choose to exercise it in a way in which it's hijacked by people who want to gain the system, mostly large corporations, then uh, you will eventually cause the breakup of your country or your jurisdiction. So, yeah, no, it's hugely important lessons for places with more than 300 yeah, million people. Yeah, it, it's, it's worth noting that whether it's whether it's India, um, Indonesia, or China, many of these countries. Um, have problems that Europe had, um, but led to, to Brexit. Right. So, if your prime minister wants to centralise power, tell them to do so, but don't use them, don't exercise that monopoly power. Naughty Turkey. There we go. A big round of applause for our panel members. Thank you very much. The U.S. Senate Andrew Chen. Thank you everybody for coming tonight. Once again, our mentor program. If you're not a member, sign up for the membership program and please take a moment to congratulate Nick Cole, who has recently become a father. Congratulations, Nick. <laughs> Any of the fathers at the table? Yeah, right. I'm just checking out the fathers. You know what you can tell? You've got great hair. See, this is what you're going to do. No, but it's been so fun. It's good. I'm going to have a joke. 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 I'm going to have a